Welcome back, everybody, to our uh, series on uh, Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of world history. So this is a series myself and Dr. Hilius Rockney have been running where we are reading Hegel's lectures on the philosophy of world history together. And we just discuss points that sort of stick out to us, points we're passionate about and points which we find intriguing, interesting, and perhaps conflicting. So today we're going to carry on into the next section, which is titled Human Passions and the Divine Idea. Yeah, and this uh, this section was very full of meat, very funny, actually, as well, the way <laughs> Hegel talks about some things. Well, I'm sure we'll get to those very uh, soon. So I, I think it's really interesting that he pinpoints as passion as this important factor in the development of world history. It's obviously passion with the divine idea, with the idea. We've been talking a lot about the idea. Passion is the first time we're really talking about passion as such. Yeah. And so I'm just looking at something from the text here. Hegel writes, uh, passion always seeks something set before it, but what it does is determined within itself and by itself. It is the unity of the determination of the will with what the subject is as such. So it's like a, the investment of the entire human that puts, put themselves in the, into whatever their passion is about. Yeah, the yeah. unity of the determination of the will, yeah. So... Um, so we have like this willing and that is unified with something else called passion, which is what we direct our will at. We direct our will through passion to the outside world. Is that what Hegel's getting at? So uh, maybe we should say that the will for Hegel is always thought plus action. Okay, the will good, is, yeah. is not something you just intend to do. It is something you're already doing with intention. Because the will doesn't exist as, as a, just a, an idea or a plan or intention. It's already some sort of action. Mm -hmm. And then when he says that it is with the subject as such, this intended action, it becomes a sort of takes on a total defining quality that what you do and this action is something that defines you as a person. You mm. are a chess player. You are, you know, a scholar or, or so, something else. So, so what you will is part of what constitutes you as a particular subject. Yes. Okay. And this so, unity. But that passion. alone, uh, that alone is not um, passion though. It needs to be the unity with yeah. the subject. Yeah. As you put it. Right. Yeah. Okay, cool. Good. And he distinguishes this rather helpfully, I think, with what he calls character. Ah, uh, yeah. So Hegel's, you know, delving into a bit of uh, psychology here. He writes, character is already too broad a term because it encompasses all particularities and denotes the whole complexion of the person. Mm -hmm. We are not concerned with a merely impotent interiority that lacks the strength to realize itself nor with merely putative purposes by which weak characters beat around the bush. <laughs> so let's just, um, this, this idea of impotent interiority, we've already touched on this before as well. Mm -hmm. That seems to be at odds with the will, right? With yeah. the way you describe the will. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, I'm not quite sure. How do you, what do you make of this distinction between character and the will and from their passion so uh the way i was looking at this is that um so one can have uh will vis-a-vis -vis doing certain actions with intentions but those actions doesn't don't need to define you as a person in the totality so that can be included within a character and so that the character may or may not have the strength to realize certain things, but a passion definitely does. That is, so there is a necessity to passion that is not there in the character. 
Okay. Or that the character is maybe fumbling around and trying to realize their passion, but for some reason they are uh, f stumbling over themselves or putting obstacles in front of themselves or, or what have mm. you. So you have like, I'm thinking of Hamlet here, right? Okay. As a, an example of this impotent deteriority that he has, mm. he really is somebody who has lots of strength, right? Really passionate about something. And yet also is stunted by in, into inaction by that very thing. He's unable to actualize his will. Yeah. He's beating around the bush, to quote Hegel, <laughs> for four hours, four yeah. very long hours. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good. But, or, or maybe that could be a counterexample to, to what Hegel is saying here. Mm. We would have to yeah. dig into it. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. We'll have to keep the back of our minds then. And so in history, Hegel writes, we do not have to do with individuals who have certain intentions, but then act like mice or gnats. Rather, we have before us the colorful din of passions. Mm, yes. So I think we get the idea, right? So passion, this unity of our will with who we are, who we constitute ourselves as being, this is one of the most, this is one of the two pieces of, of, um, of the engine of the motor of world history yeah um okay yeah it's that so it is like uh a willed action but it's supercharged <laughs> to to be like take on a uh totalizing importance yeah good okay and hegel thinks that this is yeah as you were saying like integral to uh, the movement of history because history is all about people acting people doing stuff people putting you know realizing things not right. just intending to realize things you know all easy to have intentions and wishes but actually putting it into action making an objective takes on a different kind of strength yeah and i think it's also really important this idea if we just go back to that earlier quote that i uh, read Indeed, passion always seeks something set before it, but what it does is determine within itself and by itself. So there's this self-determination mm. uh, of passion. Yeah. Uh, one of the, the, the motor of world history is its self-determination, or part of it is our self-determination, our, yeah. our free willing and our free acting. And, and this is, and Hegel contrasts this, right, to what he says, further down he says actions are not to be the mere material or external means by which the idea realizes itself mm. for individuals are knowing and willing beings and make no claim to carry out solely the designs of a pretty magic mm. they have the justifiable expectation not to have to serve as mere means so here i think hegel is warning against any any interpretation of maybe he's thinking of a particular kind of uh, historiographical approach but I understood this as him warning against an interpretation of his philosophy that sees people as merely the playthings of the idea. Yes, exactly. As yeah. being the means of the idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's right. He is warning off against this. Oh, we're all just, you know, following out the desires and wishes of some sort of grand puppet master called the idea. Right. Uh, Pretty magic. It's a nice yeah. way of thinking about it. Uh, and that this reflects another point, uh, and that is that, well, the whole thing about passion is that it's self-interest is involved. Mm -hmm. So whoever is passionate about something isn't just passionate oh, for the sake for the sake of whatever out there. It's because they find it interesting or uh, ex you know um, something they f draw are drawn to by necessity. Yeah, this is the self-determination aspect, right? Yeah. Um, I would I would call it maybe personal incentive. Okay. Because you can you can say that, well, we're acting on the behest of the self-determination of the idea. Right. Okay. Uh, okay. So yeah. I'm just really gonna exclude the idea from passion and say, like, first and foremost. It's you, your own incentives that matters, right? Napoleon and Caesar, and they were doing stuff, yeah, that put a lot of wheels in, of history in motion, but they were doing it for themselves, first and foremost. Right. No illusions about that. Yeah. 
Right. Hegel yeah, doesn't yeah. have illusions about that. And and this again puts um as you were highlighting the self-determination of individuals um they are thinking beings hegel is recognizing that and as thinking beings they cannot be mere playthings of some designs or whatever else out there yeah so i guess implicitly he's also critiquing an idea that everything that happens is the will of god or that we are just these contingent these atoms that are contingently bobbling around and doing stuff he's warning against also these other possible interpretations of why uh, historical events occur yeah but nonetheless um th they do serve as, me as means for the idea but mm -hmm. we're gonna have to think about the relationship between the passionate individuals and the resulting rationality of world history in a more complicated way than mm -hmm. just one acting on behalf of the other kind of one-sidedly yeah yeah and so a little later on something else that i thought was very interesting was hegel's critique of what he calls a uh, reflective representation about free will mm -hmm. now I, I understood this as a critique i wonder what you think um but he writes still it can be noted that the connection of these elements employs the well-known form of the unification of freedom and necessity it is customary in reflective representation to speak about free will the particular will of freedom and to place it over against it what as being in and for itself the rational mm -hmm. as something proper to itself and as iron necessity and then he goes on to say freedom in the proper sense is the rational free will the particularity of interests is only a mixture of freedom and necessity and it belongs only to the presumptive or phenomenal freedom that stands under the influence of natural determinations so it seems to me that he's drawing a distinction between freedom and free will yes he does indeed uh freedom seem so free will is a mixture of freedom and necessity whereas freedom seems to be just freedom or rational um admit i wasn't really sure what he was talking about or who he was referring to hmm. yeah he does seem to ward off against this possible interpretation that yeah there is just freedom on the side of individual actors but then the idea itself is just iron necessity uh a kind yeah. of fate providence kind of thing yeah that's an to think about but actually yeah yeah uh, hang on so freedom in the proper sense is the rational and that i think he means just rationality as such which can be the state uh family society morality all of these kind of arrangements in with in which people are um put themselves in vis-a-vis -vis one another mm -hmm. so that is kind of freedom in the big sense for hegel free will is particularly zeroed in on the individual and what they think and want and desire and that has an element of necessity to it in the sense that necessity falls under the natural inclinations natural determinations mm -hmm. okay yeah so that's why i think that he puts in the term phenomenal there because yeah. you know it appears that i am hungry I, it, I have these feelings and inclinations bubbling up within me and then I have to sort of mediate that with what I think I want to do and so on mm -hmm. and so I do think that freedom in the proper sense also will have to indirectly have this moment of uh, natural determinations because all freedom is made up of is individuals at the end of yeah. the day yeah which is why the passions are important yeah yeah so maybe the, 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 the sentence of the next paragraph actually solves our issues because he writes the connection between the particularities of human beings. Maybe there that's mm -hmm. like free will mm -hmm. and what has being in and for itself. That might be freedom in the proper sense of rationality. Is that good? As... <laughs> Don't just throw German at me. <laughs> has two aspects. <laughs> Uh, first it is found intrinsically in the concept it is the idea itself second the question concerns what the connection is in explicit terms in its mode of drawing out in its workings uh -huh. 
So now he's going to talk about how these two things connect, I suppose, free will and freedom. How they, yeah, yeah how but it starts with freedom, it looks like. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, yeah. Good. Do you want to? Yeah, so, uh, I mean, the first one is kind of very slim. He just goes through the pure idea and freedom and the sort of rationality in and for itself, which is ends up being just, yeah, universal, which has the moment of particularity of it, but it's just thought of as particularity. It's not the explicit um, particular particularity in the sense of like, it's this kind of action happening in this historical context by this individual, right? Mm. It's not a loaded, fleshed out particularity. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, it's something that's entirely with itself. It doesn't have reality with it. Yeah. Um, very could we say it's ideal yeah i think so yeah and then i guess i mean i hate to pedal this but you have the classic move then of an antithesis yeah or into <laughs> its otherness it. yeah or sorry or into its otherness or into its otherness yeah and as i understand this is the idea is that in this internal self relation the idea Mm. is itself other to itself and yeah. and this other is what becomes the outside world externality yeah. the objective world in which it uh which gives it reality yeah if we will in yeah. which it can actualize itself although hegel does kind of give us the a very quick derivation here that going into its antithesis or otherness it is actually generated from within itself. So the idea yeah. makes this otherness. Exactly. That's when we really have something ideal in the Hegelian sense. Mm. So just to qualify with the previous ideal, which was the common sense, that this is just kind of um, a pure mind, kind of pure thinking moment. But an ideal in, for Hegel is, is that it's explicitly a moment of some other structure, right? An integrated right. Uh, thing. So the idea does make this otherness, puts it out there, it generates a reality um, uh, out of itself. But then it really needs to make good on that reality, he seems to say, because he needs to posit the distinctions on their own account and with the appearance of independence vis-a-vis -vis each other. Yeah, they can't or, just collapse into each other. It has to actually be a different moment. Or, or they cannot just collapse it back into the idea of being a moment of the idea the idea yeah. kind of has to put itself into the background completely and say okay you you guys now run the show you are now freedom tell me what it is Go. What, do you, what do you want <laughs> yeah that's what a very nice are you? It. who are you <laughs> it's one of those wonderfully hegelian moves where to properly be free you have to um put yourself into this position of unfreedom of finitude yeah and let the um, other be free you can't just stay with yourself and be free um yeah you have to yeah yeah let and the other be free exactly indeed yeah and this is what's done naturally and when you're doing observation for example you're looking at an animal figuring out what they're doing you're putting aside as much as possible what the hell you know or think you know about that animal and just look what it's doing it's going to tell you its rationality is there on mm -hmm. display you know, how the, I don't know, crocodile or whatever kind of animal behaves and how it behaves and what it's doing, right? Or yeah. an owl or a mouse, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this is this is automatically taking place in uh, empirical observation. But then the final third moment, he writes, this extremity of freedom that is for itself must be considered in relation to the honor of and glory of God as the absolute idea. So <laughs> we, let's just let's just substitute God for the idea, <laughs> for the yeah. divine idea to keep things simple. Uh, the idea relates to this moment of otherness, to this moment of externality that it has itself generated. Mm -hmm. um, he goes on to write this act this aspect of finitude is thus the ground on which the spiritual element of knowing rests, knowing mm. as knowing. Which, so he's saying that it is in, 
it is only by making ourselves finite that we are able to actually come to understand ourselves, to know ourselves. Yeah, well, finitude is, is important in making the moment mm -hmm. in, initially, but then you got to take the other aspect of the moment, which is that it's a moment of something, a unity or something else, right? right? What is that greater context in which all of this is taking place in? That, I think, is the greater comprehension. We see that the moment of finitude plays an important role in seeing ourselves as moments and uh but of course it's not just finitude as such that um you know does that it's it's just kind of does does a bit of the work this finitude in relation to as a moment of the idea yeah or the finitude of the idea in relation to the idea yeah would be a better way to put it yeah which i mean this is kind of a formal point but we've already made this third move by considering the first with the second. So it's kind of automatic, right? It's there for free. Yeah. Yeah. We just have it's to make nice. it explicit. Yeah. It's just like, yeah, you got the absolute idea and the absolute idea relates to passionate people. Ah, you get the absolute idea on return for free. It goes back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, what is become, what becomes the pertinent, you know, site for, the idea is the fin is finitude and how it grasps itself in its own circumstance, which is very much marred by finitude. You know, personal circumstances, histories, biographies, situations, and, and what have you. Um, yeah. And so its own knowledge is going to be finite in that respect as an individual. But it is also an aspect of self-knowing, which no wills itself as such. Uh, so there is a Hegel talks a little bit about the pious individual who wants to be mm. saved and blessed but that doesn't seem to be align well with passion or uh, and the, the question is whether the pious and the passionate can exist together because if anything the passionate individual emphasizes the moment of finitude of particularity is it emphasizes their self-interest. That's what's their incentive, what they're driven by. I guess it depends how we understand the pious individual, in what sense. How does mm. their piety come, come out? Yeah. Because if it's in acts, if it's in works, yeah, it could work as passion works. Yeah. But yeah, I think what's interesting is that there's, there's this identity between the idea and its moment of finitude yeah. and because of this identity, when it relates, when the idea relates to its finitude, mm -hmm. when it wills itself in finitude, it is coming to know itself. Hegel calls this, uh, it's, he says it's, it's a self-certainty. Mm. Yeah. Subjectivity is to be found in objectivity. Yes. So, you know, there isn't this sharp subject-object distinction as if they're two substantially different things. Mm -hmm. But there's a bit of, there's a bit of the idea in its moment of finitude yeah and this uh this bit of identity is what sort of uh, binds them together and makes it such that in willing yourself in finitude yeah you are coming to know yourself or coming to know the idea right but i still think that there is a kind of intellectual reservedness with the pious individual okay they they see what's going on they understand it but um they want to be saved be blessed uh but it's something that resides within subjectivity mm. and that uh, sure it doesn't want itself back as knowing as hegel puts it here it it first seeks itself as finite in accord with its immediacy and its particularity and this is the sphere of appearance. It seeks itself in accord with specification of its finitude and particularity in that other stands over against it. So I'm I'm not sure if this is kind of like um, the blessed wants the good, the good, but as mm -hmm. finite, but without um, putting in a substantial action or just putting in action as required, but not as action as it itself um 
finds for itself because the interest is on the side of the universal with the pious mm. individual. That's yeah. why they're pious, right? <laughs> the background yeah. motivation for a pious person is, yeah, I am a moment of universal. And it's great. I just want to keep keep being that. Whereas the passionate person is going to be, I am the universal. And you better recognize these this, in, in these deeds. Right? So I'm going to cross the Rubicon. Watch me. <laughs> Isn't there something? Okay. Isn't there something, though, pious and passionate in someone like Luther, for example? Yeah, okay. It seems to me that Hegel here has, a, has in mind a notion of piety, which is maybe something like hermeticism or ascetism, a sort of a piety that thinks that it's all about what's internal that counts and doesn't find... It doesn't find the actualization of piety in finitude, in externality. I mean, or what about St. Peter, who, who, who founds the church? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's pretty, that's pretty world historical. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, that's not just beating around the bush. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I, th I think maybe he's thinking about a particular kind of pious individual here when he says the moral truth resides in pure subjectivity. Sure. Yeah. It's, um, uh, it strikes me as someone who's very, again, and, and, and a seat and ascetic. Okay. Yeah. Well, in terms of understanding, we are, you know, separating these various different, uh, modes of being or characteristics, but they could exist, coexist in an individual concretely because individuals are mishmash of all these things but in terms of for purposes of explanation we are separating them out yeah of course yeah, yeah. the pious is not passionate because their basic orientation is at odds yeah but yeah. as individuals we're just wandering contradictions and so yes of course they can coexist but yeah you're right it's a very sorry you're right it's a very interesting um, distinction that he draws between piety and passion Anyway, and this, and this sort of acts as a springboard for Hegel to then talk about the actual occurrence of passions. Yeah. So we said it before many times, but, you know, passions occur when individuals place their certainty in, part, in their particularity and seek to actualize it. Yeah. So you know, I think we've been sort of hinting at this a lot already, but there is passion when your action in objectivity, in finitude, in externality, is one which seems to accord with your, with your, with who you are, with your subjectivity. When he says there's certainty, um, and you're trying to actualize what's within you in the in the external world. Yes, although I would add a caveat to that, and that is that there is not some secret essence that is ready made of you know, who you are until you do the thing. Yeah. Right. So I think the onus is on action and it's only in reflection that we can say, yes, the essence of this person is in doing that because they've done it. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so Gandhi yeah. is, you know, selfless um, opposition demonstrating against the British because he did that. Yeah. That, and he was driven by it from his own necessity uh, mm -hmm. that he found absolutely certain. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. an impotent interiority. Um, no, yes, no, yes, very much no. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and others is whole thing about happiness and satisfaction, which is just brutal. That is pretty brutal, and and might be a point of contention. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. Let's let's dig into that. So Hegel claims that for world historical individuals who pursue their passion, happiness falls by the wayside. It's yeah. not really the primary thing. Yeah, it seems to be that. If you get happiness from it, great, good for you. That's a contingency, but yeah. It's just kind of irrelevant. Yeah. And he 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 emphasizes satisfaction. Yeah. Satisfaction is when you have successfully actualized um your passion. Uh-huh. And you can be satisfied but not happy. Yeah. And that's fine. Yeah. So maybe we should just um very quickly define what Hegel means by happiness. Yeah. And he just says those who find harmony with themselves and enjoy themselves in their existence are called happy. Simple as. So, yeah. <laughs> Which is interesting because it seems to suggest that 
there is a tension within the individual mm. between their passion yeah and a a reconciliation with themselves yeah passion seems to go from this paragraph it, it seems to be that passion almost goes against any kind of self uh, any kind of reconciliation with of the with, of the individual with themselves um mm -hmm. yeah I, and he doesn't really say much more about it perhaps there's something he talks about in the philosophy of spirit and that's interesting how passion is kind of like cleaving individuals from themselves yeah yeah breaking them in apart. this respect the, the pious individual might be happier yeah uh, than the passionate individual because the pious individual might have more harmony mm -hmm. with themselves it might be they might have there might be more reconciliation with who they are mm -hmm. um, now but is that really the case mm. um why couldn't we think of you know following or like um, um um unfolding or fulfilling your passion as being the most happy why mm -hmm. why don't why don't we just call that the the most happy I think Hegel is using, I think they're being used in very technical senses. Uh -huh. I don't think Hegel is imagining Alexander miserable. Yeah. I get the impression that happy is a kind of contented state uh -huh. where you no longer have this urge to actualize yourself in uh in uh, finitude you, you no longer have the urge to finitize yourself and to find yourself outside of yourself you're sort of in restful contemplation and that's it uh whereas passion seems to be this this urge to finitize yourself in order to find yourself and to actualize and grow and so on and so forth yeah and so I don't think he's saying, I don't think the contrast is between someone sort of, you know, happy in the psychological sense of being pleased with oneself or joyful or something like that. I think it's something much more technical. It's okay. almost like restful contemplation versus uh, restless action. Uh -huh. Because it seems like for me, it sounds like what Hegel is describing as the harmonious state situation where just enjoy themselves and the existence that sounds like actual misery because mm. mm. that is what may, would make somebody miserable is to just to put them in a state where everything is kind of nice and okay and they just yeah. get bored <laughs> so i think uh yeah. genuine happiness comes from putting yourself out there which turns into development and progression yeah yeah i'm yeah i really don't know enough about how hegel conceives of happiness or these things um he's just sort of throwing these terms at us and um yeah and it it's kind of it does seem to be a general contender for him it does seem to be that happiness seems to be something that he thinks that people might genuinely desire yeah like it wouldn't just be boring okay right i mean otherwise he wouldn't well, bring it up as a sure well there is a difference between uh, thinking uh what you well like uh, imagining what you want and actually having it because mm -hmm. we okay. can get pulled by oh yeah if i just have a you know a house and a family and a bunch of bunch of things that are just pure possibilities at this point then i'll be fine i'll be then i'll be good but then once you get there, you find out, holy shit, this is absolute <laughs> this is misery. This is hell. This is torture on earth. Why don't they sleep? <laughs> um, uh, so, so yeah, I, yeah. Why make this separate path yeah. for free beings, for free willers such as ourselves? That would be an option to passion. Mm. Um, it seems to be a break here in, in the universality of Hegel's thought that in principle, no, we should all be gunning for this because this should be the better life. Mm. 
this would be the 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 more you know alive life the lived life the the life of examination of of, of adventure mm -hmm. and what what have you i mean if anything what history has taught us is that the majority of people are actually not like this that there are few individuals who have this restlessness and these are the ones that carve their names into history um not everyone has the capacity to be an alexander and go out and conquer persia some people just want to you know chill out in greece and <laughs> and just consolidate and just be happy there yeah but i think also the example you give is um has a flaw in the sense that not everybody possibly even can become an alexander because becoming an alexander presupposes you have 10,000 people who are willing to form a phalanx for you <laughs> that too yeah so it's i was watching this program about uh, a girl uh, um, Amer about americans living in poverty and one of them wrote a got a book contract to write about poverty and got you know gained some success from that but then she pointed out that you know this is a unique stroke of luck that only works for one person but is ungeneralizable for everybody else because as soon as everybody writes a book on poverty mm. right they, they can't get a success from that yes yeah. uh so there's something yeah. in the examples themselves that kind of excludes others from taking on that framework uh, in principle however i think things that motivate people to get people going to get people in a state of you know finding something interesting to do and being happy and passionate and whatnot those aren't i don't think follow the same kind of particularist exclusionary logic those are something that we all all it all lives within us in virtue of us being free and self-conscious mm. i so want hegel better step up to that I'm actually very I'd be very interested to I'm very now that we're talking about this I'm very curious to see how things develop because now I'm wondering whether passion is just the special providence of world historical movements and is absent from the vast majority of people's lives and the vast majority are just happy and it's only the, it's only those that are involved in world historical events that actually uh, exhibit passion because if passion is the movement of world history and it's clearly the case that everything that has occurred is not part of world history it's not significant equally mm -hmm. it seems to follow that the vast majority of individuals the vast majority of historical events are bereft of passion and that they're just uh they would fall under some other category is but I'd be very curious. Is, to see. Yeah, is that? But is that the right to think? Right way to think about it? Again, going back to Alexander, and his ten thousand people in phalanx, are, are those are those guys just not passionate about you know thrusting their spears and being in formation? Um, are they just the right are they just you know <laughs> he could just have he, content being in the phalanx? It seems to me they are seeing themselves part of Alexander's project going into asia minor and giving the persians a good thrashing and coming home with some bounty this i wonder like though, <laughs> I, I wonder whether they do see the same thing as alexander or at least i think hegel might not be certain of that mm. uh, he talks about it later on right when we get to individuals um maybe we should park this until we get to that and we can mm. um, talk about it again okay sure yeah yeah um We've, we've spoken a lot about how it seems that passion shouldn't be missing from everyday people's lives mm -hmm. and that happiness seems to be equal to boredom. I think on the other hand, we might also say that passion might also be uh, tiring and might be something blinding even maybe, this mm -hmm. uh, relentless urge to actualize yourself at the expense of other things yeah might not necessarily be the best thing all the time okay yeah the best thing for everyone yeah okay that's good good way to put it um 
I'm reminded of a movie called, I think, Contiki, okay. where a Norwegian explorer, I think it was, um, wants to demonstrate that a bunch of ancestral people, how they got into an island in the middle of the Pacific, I think it was, or somewhere, which mm -hmm. kind of seemed impossible by modern standards, how anyone could get there without sailboats. But he proves it through, you know, building a raft and just going with the current. And it's an arduous journey. And at the same time, he has a family and whatnot. But his passion to prove this alienates them. And mm. by the end of the movie, he's like, yes, he achieved the exploration thing. He's proved the thing he wanted, but he loses the family. Yeah. I mean, this is something that I think is a bit of a theme in, mm. in history, right? It's these great individuals seem to also be lonely. They seem to not... We don't we don't deny their greatness, but we also say that they lacked a lot of the things that we think are essential to a good life. Okay. Yeah. Um I don't want to talk about Alexander again because Well, let's take MLK. Okay. Who? Martin Luther King. I don't know enough about him. <laughs> well, he seems to be driven extremely passionately. Yeah, and, and he, he saw he, he saw uh, the kind of uh, stuff he was engaged in to be necessity i, ju I yeah. just have to do it and yeah. it's the fact that i have to do it that keeps me going yeah i don't know enough about his personal life though to know what kind of sacrifices that were involved in that um well, he had a family but he also cheated so you know yeah <laughs> seemed to <laughs> live a it's kind a of goal. ordinary life in, in among this stuff yeah. yeah yeah that's true yeah that would be a good counter example i guess but think of our images of the egotistical artist, for example, mm. or the uh, the single-minded general. Yeah. But yeah. now mm. we can I can also I can also bring in another counterexample and say, well, there are thousands of egotistical driven um, artists, generals, and what have you. They don't make the cloth, the cut of the historical cloth, right? Yeah. They're just dickheads. They don't even have the yeah, but then what what <laughs> makes one dickhead to you know elevate it to historical importance and another not? Well, that's something that we have to look at. Um, Just historical contingency. Well, if we look well, if we look at the bottom of the page, for example, Hegel writes: the singular self consciousness elevates the empty objectivity to a thinking of the universal, mm. a right. willing yeah. and knowing of the ethical. Yeah, it renders the particular will commensurate with the universal will as it is in and for itself. That is the key. Yeah. So it, it has to reflect the universal. Yeah. So, so you can't just egotistically, you can't just send all your men into battle to die because you woke up funny that morning. Yeah. <laughs> or being an asshole uh, to other people and paint your paintings. Yeah. Yeah. It needs to somehow be part of this universalization of your particular will. Um, yeah. And that means that what you're doing is part of the ethical, is part of the general mm -hmm. uh, universality. Yeah. But as far as I can see, that gives you no real excuse to be a dickhead. I think, so I think again, <laughs> this is what Hegel talks about towards the end. And I think that's really interesting, actually. But I think we should park it until then. Okay, okay, okay. Because he does talk about, he does talk about people that say, Alexander may have been great, but he was a, you know, a bad person. Yeah. And, you know, he says that's just irrelevant. Yeah. Uh, but we, we'll, we should get to that later, I think. Okay. Yeah, I should start building a parking house, you know, with the much parking, you must think you want to park. <laughs> that's such a dad joke, Philip. <laughs> <laughs> Let's park that as well. Yes. <laughs> Thank you for stooping down to my level. <laughs> I could. As you were mentioning, the, um, the individuals that become of you know world historical importance, some people reflect the universal, such that the whole question of ethical comes also uh, into it, mm -hmm. in the sense that they are immediately kind of concretizing the best expression of their contemporary values, yeah, such that they are possible and exist at that time.
it me, leads me to think about uh, the Gladiator, the movie Gladiator, where, oh, yeah. uh, like, why is Maximus the hero and Commodus is the villain? So, um, is it the fact that Maximus reflects the universal in the kind of stuff he's doing? Or is there something else about Mac Maximus in his particular virtues that make him kind of um, attractive to us? Mm -hmm. Because you could also say that Commodus is the reflection of the universal because he's the emperor. Right. Right. Yeah. He is the state. How much more universal can you get? Yeah. Yeah. So what's the problem? So I guess, yeah, we have to. So one bad thing about Commodus might be that he seems to be a tyrant. Yeah. Which, from my little knowledge of Rome, is a bad thing. Yeah. Uh, he killed his dad. He killed Marcus Aurelius to become emperor. Yeah. That's a big no-no, I guess. Yeah. Bit of incest. Yeah. And yeah, yeah. So, uh, the so, movie... so, so the point is, he seems to not be in accordance with the ethical. Mm -hmm. uh, simply being emperor, or rather, being emperor seems to be conflicting with all these other things that don't seem to be in line with the ethical of Rome. Right. Yeah. So it's really a reflection of his singularity rather than him being a reflection of the universal. Right. Okay. Yeah. yeah exactly. Yeah. And so, why is Maximus the universal? Yeah, that's that's the question. Um, what is it about Maximus? Well, well he, he in the beginning he's dutiful, right, and yeah. upstanding, right, and he fulfills follows his duty and sees him. He readily admits, yeah, I'm just a moment of this machine, and I'm going to do the thing that needs to be doing, be done. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah. he's actually very submissive in the beginning. He, he sees himself completely as a moment of the machine. Like, whatever they have to do. Like, I remember Marcus what? Aurelius asks him, what are we doing here? Yeah. Why have we been fighting for all this time? Yeah. And and Maximus, I think, says, for the glory of Rome. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Which is really interesting because you've got the emperor yeah. who is actually reflecting on why they're doing it. Yeah. How is this according with our ethical principle? Yeah. sure. And Maximus is like, well, it just does because it's about the glory of Rome. Yeah. And that's all I'm here to do. Nah. Um, but Maximus, in the beginning, he doesn't really want to be there. No, he, he does it because he, he he knows he has to. But at the same time, he wants to be back at the farm. Maximus, yeah. the farmer, as they yeah. say. He wants to be happy. Yeah, he wants to be happy. Yeah, he wants to be content. You know the. He does. Um, so it's interesting how, but then. Does that mean um, that he's not really the heroic at that point? I don't think he is, actually, in, at least in the sense of as an individual. I mean, mm -hmm. he obviously, he's presented as a great general. Yeah. But given what we've discussed so far, he mm -hmm. seems to be much more, he seems to be just a means or a moment of, the, of Rome. Yeah, and as an individual, as Maximus, he just wants to be content with his wife and his son yeah. on their farm in Spain. Yeah. Interestingly, it's only once he's been torn away from the institution of the army, and he's had his arm, his family torn away from him. Yeah. That he suddenly has passion. There is something. He has this restlessness to do something and to actualize something about his subjectivity at which point in the movie do you speak about this it sort of happens i guess so the conditions for it happening must be um him being stripped of his rank so he mm -hmm. loses the institutional he's no longer a moment of the empire in the way that yeah, he yeah. was yeah and the loss of his family so yeah. he's no longer there is no longer that thing which he thinks will he will have happiness in yeah, yeah, so he is stripped of all ethical life, basically. He's stripped of ethical life, exactly. Yeah, and he has consigned himself to death. Yeah, basically, yeah. Yeah, and then and he gets, becomes a slave. Yeah, and he gets picked up and put into the arena. And. And then he just fights. And then he just fights. It's true. Then it, there is just survival. It's not yeah. really passion per se. I think. 
I can't remember the movie very well. There is a moment where the picture sort of widens and mm. the possibility of overthrowing Commodus or even killing Commodus becomes real. Yes, that, that comes up a, very, a bit later, but there is something that happens in the arena where he fights again mm -hmm. right? because he, he initially kind of just consigns himself to death, but something occurs where he keeps on fighting and then the possibility emerges that, well, hang on, if I keep on fighting, keep doing this stuff, then I can go into the big arena uh, and get yeah. in close proximity with Commodus and kill him. Then it gets motivated by vengeance, which is supremely you know, selfish. Yeah. I mean, yeah. L let's not forget that referent that he says throughout the whole movie. The moment he becomes a slave. Yeah. Like, I am Maximus Decimus Blah, yeah. leader of X, yeah, father yeah. to... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... So I will have my vengeance. So yeah, yeah, vengeance is it's all about vengeance and it's all about Yeah, because of the ethical status he's lost. Yeah. Yeah. But that vengeance though seems to okay, so maybe this is a, this is how we answer the question of why is a hero? Because his quest for vengeance or his motivations for vengeance seem to accord with the ethical principle, with the universality. Yes. Yeah. Um it seems just, it seems <laughs> right, it seems yeah. good yeah. that he wants to do this. Yeah, and it, it aligns with the necessity of the state at that point because the Senate is completely powerless. Right. The Praetorian Guard is, is you know, it, Commodus basically turned the whole place into police state. Nobody is able to do anything. The force is overwhelming, except yes. in this one place, which is the arena, which Commodus uses to maintain his power base, right. Bread and Circus. It's the one place where, where um, Maximus can kind of challenge him openly and defiantly and Commodus is powerless to do anything about it in the center of power mm. which yeah, is very, nice. very dialectical very yeah. sort of nice flip uh, flip there it is yeah yeah and yeah yeah you're right how it's this in this kind of situation it becomes a his passion aligns with the universal and then he becomes historic or uh, like heroic in a, yeah. a bigger sense or at least in the Hegelian sense, that seems yeah, yeah, to be yeah. how it works. Yeah, but and he and he says he comes to see he, himself. He also knowing knows explicitly that his um, plan aligns with the universal consciousness, so to speak. Yeah, and he's happy with that. Yeah, if anything, it kind of offers him redemption that I can once again become ethical. Right, Definitely. I can once again become Maximus, blah blah, general, and so on. Yeah, and in one sense, he. He kind of opts for that. He he is willing to go, but he is willing to abandon his vengeance and go back to the ethical, become a general, and do this the stuff as a commander again, right? Despite losing his family, because he wants there's an escape scene and he tries to flee, so he is wanting to abandon his vengeance, right? Yeah, so it makes him even more ethical again, mm. right? So he's like, yeah, okay, I'll, I'll I'll ditch this stuff and do it proper with the army. Yeah, yeah. Nice, yeah. Yeah. Very good. So hey, there we have it, kids. Yeah, Gladiator there you go. A yeah, Hegelian just... analysis of uh, oh. Gladiator. Yeah. Um, and, and just a very nice quote, I think, at the bottom of page 173, where Hegel talks about this, about uh, the universal and the ethical of a particular mm -hmm. civilization. He says, these are the well-known duties and laws that each individual acknowledges, yeah. the objective aspects of one's status and country. Yeah. There is nothing problematic about them. Weak-willed persons are the ones who think they call for extensive discussion. <laughs> <laughs> so, comedy aside, yeah. Hegel seems to think that if something is this universal, this ethical, it's something that's obvious to everyone. Everyone knows what is the right thing to do. And when you have someone like... Like... Uh, I, uh, the gladiator example doesn't work anymore. But when you have someone who will dispute it, they, these are some these are people that are weak-willed for Hegel. I take it because they, they they lack the will to actualize these things, mm -hmm. uh, to actually uh, accord with the ethical. Pretty harsh uh, indictment. Yeah. Um, for some reason, this makes me think of, for example, uh, drafting in the army, which was mm -hmm. like an interesting hot topic in the early months in the early weeks of the war in ukraine yeah 
Um, there was a bit of ambiguity. There was a bit of uncertainty, I think, amongst people as to whether drafting was ethical. Mm-hmm. This sort of almost hunting down of uh, men that were running away or yeah. sort of trying to get away from fighting so they right. can be forced back to fight. Yeah. Um, you know, for Hegel, clearly, <laughs> they had have, they have the ethical duty to defend their state because for Hegel, Hegel, that's how Hegel would identify the ethical of the state. Um, and he would just take that as obvious. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah. Yeah, because the ethical is kind of the soil of their humanity. Right? Who they are yeah. is their customs, their behavior, their neighbors, the people they're around. Right? All of this forms part of the community, forms part of the nation, forms part of the state. Yeah. And the state is this entity. And if the state is under attack, <laughs> it will marshal up its strength in, in, and protect itself any way it can. Um, yeah. And so it is objectively a non-starter to bring this into discussion because it it is forsaking your spirit if you are uh, fleeing from the situation. Exactly, yeah. Again, one of those uh, uh, big pills to swallow. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. Um, Sad stuff. Yeah. But we we finally arrived uh, to great figures in history. Hmm. So he writes, over against this universality of ethical custom, there is a second universal that comes into prominence and expresses itself in the great figures of history. Yeah. And therein makes, he talks about the conflict, right? Yeah. So this is this is not a, you know, um, a kind of a, sh- um, a matter of course, the, un- the second universal steps in because, hang on, there is already a universal. It's called the BDC of the Ethical Life and we're running things here, right? It's yeah. working. It's the status quo. Why do we need you? Why do we need to have climate change? All right? Get away. <laughs> you're, you're, you're messing with business. Stop that. All right? Yeah. 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 So Hegel writes, the universal remains what it was, but the higher power within it rises to prominence and intrudes upon it. Mm. I think that's really important. Yeah. Uh, I don't think we should think about it as two universals in conflict colliding with each other it's a sort of a development out of the existing universal sure but that first and, universal is going to look upon the the second yeah. thing as not as universal as yeah. just going to be you know as a these, particular yeah this particular these people are idiots right yeah yeah so there, there, there will eventually be tension between universals obviously but i think it's important to think to, to understand it within this developmental process Mm -hmm. yeah that the new universal uh rises like a phoenix from the ashes of the old universal um and then is in conflict with it (laughs) we don't need to go to mythical beasts for this we could just think of a chicken and an egg you know the egg comes out of the chicken comes into the chicken and starts taking off the uh, the, uh, taking off the uh, food existing food that there is there's less food for everybody right yeah but in the realm of poultry the phoenix is so much more noble than the chicken <laughs> <laughs> i bet that's the first time you thought jungle fowl how about poultry. that huh? yeah <laughs> it's foul <laughs> jungle fowl <laughs> jungle fowl mm. um and so yeah and so Hegel then goes on to write this constitutes but, but, yeah go on. yeah but i think that the the reason we should think about why it become becomes hostile to the new power emerging is because while none of this is apparent as universal the universal is always embodied in determinate existences particular actions and it's only once a bunch of them have happened and you see you know through events taking place in uh, uh, um uh, a period of time that you see okay huh, there's a logic emerging here ah maybe there's a you know a pattern a universality that a new system of values is coming out right it's not just uh but not in the moment right in the moment it's a bit more so let's take an example so like slavery right mm-hmm. um for for a period of time that was just yeah it was okay it was fine everybody was doing it business here as usual uh and but there were some people probably thought Guys, this is monstrous. We should just stop this. Yeah. But they were presumably looked at as lunatics. But why would you stop something such so lucrative? But just making all the khakis is wonderful, right? It's about the, the money. Uh, but yeah. yeah, over time, more and more people 
come and stand out against until it boils over to a point where I have to suddenly mm. have a civil war going on in, in a big country like so um yeah. there you have something that may start off as particular thing but actually grows into becoming um yeah a new a new kind of standard a new value system that, yeah. that becomes the new universal that becomes accepted by everybody yeah that's a really good that's a good way of putting it actually um actually another way of thinking about it could, could also be religion right back in Rome, roman empire you had paganism that was, that was the thing zeus you know doing his thing to everybody in all shapes and forms yeah, and you have these Christians. What? Just you only have one God? Are you crazy, man? Why would Literacy. you limit yourself to just one God? It's insane. Three hundred years later, who look who's boss? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. But so I think what's really interesting though is um, that Hegel seems to be suggesting that the movement from universal from universalities <clears throat> has got to be done by an individual. Mm -hmm. Absolutely right yep um, nothing else to, can get the, can get the job done so from a purely technical sense you've got the universal and then there's an individual and that individual is going to encapsulate a new kind of universality yes and then you're going to get it as the the proper universal mm -hmm. um and this is a very curious thought because on the face of it, it looks like a great man theory of history. Mm -hmm. But I don't think Hegel is doing that. Mm -hmm. I think Hegel's okay. actually, so I mean, just very, very broadly, you either think, no, you either, most people don't think of believe in a great man theory of history anymore. But you, the opposite idea would be something like you've got forces, like unconscious forces that swirl around in society and things just happen. Okay. And it doesn't matter if it's Winston Churchill or if it's Clement Attlee or whoever, mm -hmm. um, things are just going to happen. They might okay. happen a bit differently, but yeah. they're not really motivating in the process. Okay. I think Hegel is saying something kind of in between. He's saying, he's not yeah. saying that individuals use their individuality or rather individuals universalize their individuality. And that's what makes it the universal. I think he's saying that individuals grasp a new universal yeah. uh, through their individuality, but yeah. it's not just something that they impose on the world. No. It's something that they grasp and they then uh, bring out, make explicit. Mm. Yeah. Uh, he writes, it is precisely the great historical figures, the world's historical individuals who grasp such a universal and turn it to their purposes. Mm -hmm. They can be called heroes, those who produce something universal. They create it out of a source whose content was not yet at hand in a known determinate existence. And yeah. thus, they seem to create it out of themselves, out of their inwardness. Yeah. But that's not the case. They appear initially to be simply their own goals and specific characters, mm -hmm. their passion. Yeah. But in fact, their passion is something universal. Yes. And I think that probably connects what we said earlier about the uh, identity between the finitude and the idea or the, the fit. Yeah. And the way they're, they have an identity. And so, yeah. What makes this a uh, properly universal passion is that it's in accordance with the idea. Yeah. So, so yeah, so it's neither, it's not Alexander just being a selfish git and doing what he wants to do. Yeah. And nor is it that, the economic conditions of ancient Greece and ancient Persia are such that any ruler would have inevitably taken over. Mm -hmm. It's rather part of what it is for Alexander to be Alexander is to recognize a new kind of universality and to set about making it reality, giving it determinate existence through his passion. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We don't need to. We can also use a contemporary example, like I don't know, Steve Jobs, right? Yeah, I don't know. I don't know why I keep saying Alexander. It must be my. Let's <laughs> go heritage. back to. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, like Steve Jobs is an iPhone, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, Just Alexander, so much sexier than Steve it, Jobs. It, but okay. it, is, it is a bit sexier, but uh, but I think it's also nice to have some. Yeah, yeah, yeah. More contemporary, present examples, and the reason that works is because there is utility in it. The, that. You know, it's useful to a lot of people and it's 
just have more, more handy than just having a simple a single function on this entity then you can have like a smartphone which has multiple things they can do so it just became more useful more convenient and cool right because they all did the whole set of made it so that it's not just functional but also has an aesthetic to it it can be formed part of your identity so there is a lot of social engineering around it as well and uh he's somebody who tapped into that aspect whereas the people at microsoft at that time were like how can you write business emails on that little thing like why would anyone want to pay so much for such a thing yeah it's because they didn't see that you know new universal on the horizon whereas somebody like steve jobs did and brought it into being yeah yeah but he's I mean, not like us you know didn't come out of the blue he you know used a bunch of other ideas that were already existing before him and he just pushed it a little bit further and put it together in a nicer yeah. way yeah 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 that's a really good example i mean you know hegel writes they have the best understanding of what needs to be done mm. they must heed it because they feel it because it is already inwardly their own and now yeah. comes into existence for the first time um yeah so what's on the cusp of our horizon is the metaverse you know mark zuckerberg is really well, feeling super strong about this right it is him this dog well, yeah. well we don't know do we that's the thing yeah um, we don't know we'll only know afterwards yeah but he's definitely he definitely looks like a world historical individual who is trying to actualize his passion yeah um whether or not it pans out we will have to uh Wait. Well, he is actualizing his passion for sure, but whether it takes on world historical significance, that, that remains to be seen. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I guess that's an interesting point, though, right? Because Hegel's philosophy doesn't give you, as with almost all aspects of, as with all aspects of his philosophy, does not give you anything prescriptive. Hegel is not telling us uh, how to recognize world historical individuals. You, know, you 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 couldn't get a uh, uh, a political manifesto out of this. No, not uh, the prescriptive. No, yeah, it's fundamentally retrospective. It's you've got yeah. a bunch of. I, I mean, as it was in as it is in every world historical situation, you have a bunch of individuals, and they're all trying to do something, mm -hmm. and only one of them or a few of them <clears throat> will actually make that world historical moment actualize yeah and that's when we know yeah um so again emphasizing the fundamentally retrospective um character of uh, philosophy of world history absolutely and also it is also shows just how every sort of new universal situation that kind of emerges it's going to be some novelty yeah it's going to be something that hasn't yet been there exactly so yet, something that someone hasn't yeah. grasped before yeah and it's going to be um even though it's new it's also going to be logically sort of following the development of what came before it so yeah it's not that it's just like a bunch of series of dice that are being rolled and we just okay now it's this universal and then then right no it makes sense that this one comes after that one and, and so on yeah. yeah yeah and we make sense of it by looking at how it came about indeed which constitutes really world history as such right but exactly. we take all of these different um, shapes together and con consider them in context, yeah. that bigger context. I think now might be a good point for us to get those cars out of the parking space <laughs> 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 and revisit uh, sort of, I've kind of forgotten what we're talking about, but something about world historical individuals behaving in a way that is obviously egotistical but is significant and people that are just being egotistical mm -hmm. uh, and also why do they have to be assholes why can't they be world historical and be good uh why well, do they have yeah well interestingly at the very end of this section hegel talks about these great individuals in a manner that the way they behave because of their passion makes them look less human Mm. he talks about them like taking on an animal-like appearance because their being and spirit is so interlinked that they never get alienated from it and ponder it yeah 
um i think this is the kind of on a fundamental restlessness level. right huh this is this is the restlessness that we were talking about earlier of uh uh when we were distinguishing maybe satisfaction from happiness their uh their passion is so great that yeah, they... yeah it's only restless vis-a-vis -vis, uh, actuality but it's not yeah. restless within themselves no, in no, terms no, no, of no. like oh do i really want to you know protest against the uh, you know destruction of climate yeah no, exactly. no. that is never in question that is yeah. like as certain as descartes is about the cognitive yeah exactly yeah. um so the restlessness comes in them getting it done right you know yeah. uh, musk wanting to tear down twitter that is the restlessness and he knows that they must do it <laughs> and, and, and this is their strength right this is what makes them stronger and more able to actualize their passion. It's because there is such a, a tight unity in who they are and what they do Yeah. in comparison to someone who might, well, I guess in comparison to philosophers, I mean, philosophers kind of come out bad in this. <laughs> we, we, I don't think philosophers count as world historical individuals. Nope, no, they don't. don't no. And I think Hegel ad, 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 admits to that and confesses. Yeah, we're, nothing, uh, you know, world historical comes out of philosophical activity as such. Yeah, exactly. the only thing that comes out of philosophical activity is more philosophical activity. Well, yes, yes. it's the recognition of it. Yeah, by yeah. doing more philosophy. Yeah, <laughs> but society, ethical things, you know, um, civil liberties and uh, fight for rights and blah blah blah. It usually takes on a uh, a whole different kind of rhetoric and mm. uh, a way of doing it yeah and yeah. it has to appeal to people there's a lot of rhetoric there's a lot of courage and the way you get courage is by doing courageous acts again and again and again yeah definitely yeah so hegel revisits this whole happiness and satisfaction thing yeah and he writes because they are driven unresistingly to do what they do, they are satisfied. They have not been happy, for their work has perhaps become bitter to them, or at the moment they achieved their goal, they have died or were murdered or exiled. Very Roman. <laughs> they sacrificed their personality. Their mm. entire life was a sacrifice. Yeah. And that they were happy is a consolation for those who need such a consolation. So Hegel really likes grit. He's a man of grit. No, he's a man of great, he's a man of sacrifice, right? It's all about sacrifice as well. It's yeah. It's really that he sees them as having given themselves completely to their passion at the expense of everything else. Yes, which also makes them appear animal-like because they seem to reduce their humanity, which is multidimensional, into this one-dimensional activity. Yeah. To use a antiquated example again, it's Alexander dying in India. It's you know he just the wasn't happy. Spear. With, he wasn't happy with Persia. It wasn't enough. <laughs> he had to keep going. Yeah, and he died. Well, he was actually planning a a campaign westward. That was also in the in the on in the plan. Oh, is that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wanted to go 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 to Italy and take that stuff. That would have been incredible. Yeah. But I suspect that once he had conquered India, he would have found out about China and he would have just kept going. <laughs> oh, yeah. He would have found out about, hang on, there's something even further <laughs> east of these guys. Exactly. Yeah. Alexander would have never wept because there would have been so many more worlds to conquer. <laughs> um, ah, but then you get, don't you get into a kind of contradiction with yourself? Uh, if like you want to conquer all these worlds and then you see, realize that, hang on, there's infinite worlds to conquer. Mm. Should, is is that going to be a moment of despair for Alexander or great joy? It's like, oh my God, I can keep on doing this forever. Fantastic. It must be a mixture of both, right? It must mm. be a satisfaction, satisfaction of your ability to actualize your passion. Because can you mm. imagine, can you imagine if Alexander had grown old? Can you imagine the kind of old king he would have been like a 50 years? He would have been like an Odysseus coming mm. back to Ithaca. Uh, and growing bored of being at home, just being a, uh, just ruling over a stable land. Mm -hmm. He would have just constantly dreamt of adventure and going out and doing things. 
Um, someone like Alexander seems to have required that. On the other hand, though, it would have been also, I guess, a source of despair because it would never finish. But I wonder if uh, all human beings need a bit of that progression. Mm. That it isn't unique to Alexander. He might have uh, whole, focused in on a particular instance of this, but progression as such is or feeling like you're moving forward in life is more universal. Mm. And that passionate people just take this progression and steer it into a particular, like a singular activity. But the the movement itself is uh, something that's necessary to all, to all human beings. Yeah. Unless and you're just happy. Well, and I would say that is genuine happiness. And the other thing is kind of like a illusion of contentment mm. that you think you'll be happy, but getting what you think you will make you happy is going to make you miserable. The old Zizekian point. It's Sean, it's Sean. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, again, I'd be very interested to read the sections in the philosophy of spirit where Hegel talks about happiness mm. because he seems very critical of it. But then again, we're also just talking about world history. So maybe he's really just restricting himself to world history. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. He's not thinking about it in general. Right. Interesting thing. I mean, it's, it's still a question for me whether. Mm passion needs to have sacrifice to the extent of taking away happiness yeah uh or, or alternatively that really this kind of passion is really the genuine happiness and then the other mm. thing is kind of a silly silly thing we tell ourselves just to the first point i don't think hegel's saying it's necessary right i think he's just saying it seems like that's what's going to happen more, most of the time mm -hmm. yeah. like it is passion as such that you will find it difficult to there's, there's an interesting line uh, a bit above where he talks about what great persons do is to act in order to satisfy themselves not others mm -hmm. and i think hegel's point is if you are such a person if you are, if you have such a passion the the fundamentals of reality will just simply you will come up against some things because you will constantly be trying to just actualize yourself mm -hmm. and you will not take into account others. Yeah. And that will just have repercussions. Mm -hmm. um, you will not be able to do things like everyone else. It's very, I mean, the whole thing is kind of bizarre because on the one hand, these great individuals bring into being a new universality, a new sort of, horizon for humanity mm. and then once and in that respect they must be the most human yeah but in living their lives they actually become one more than one dimensional and, and more animal like and in that respect they're less human mm. yeah so there's a stretching out of humanity within these individuals making them caricatures and genuine people all at once yeah yeah that's a very good point yeah i would just i mean the final thing that i'd like to talk about is this idea of uh immorality functioning as a as a judgment in our assessment of world historical individuals okay um i think this is something that is ex particularly current nowadays we talk a lot about more the immorality of past individuals uh -huh. uh, not always world historical individuals but we can focus on world historical individuals yeah and i think what hegel would say to this kind of idea is that the par particular immorality of the individual is irrelevant in comparison to their world historical significance uh so again hegel is privileging the advancement of the ethical mm -hmm. over and above uh individual interests yeah or particularities 
Yeah. He writes, Alexander's thirst for conquest was supposedly something subjective and for that yeah. reason, not something good. Uh -huh. Such modes of inquiry do not concern us. Um, it's because he sees in this conquest something that is over and above Alexander's subjectivity that suddenly the slaughter of tens of thousands of people uh, becomes irrelevant. It becomes a moment in world history. And it's sort of overshadowed by the uh, the introduction of a new ethical universality. Sure, yeah. I wouldn't call it irrelevant directly. I mean, that's <laughs> part of the the movement that he was engaged in. Yeah. But it's, let's say, I don't know, uh, Alexander had, I don't know, let's say he was a sadist and actually enjoyed the violence. Mm -hmm. That would be something irrelevant. Uh, right. It's okay. his subjective kind of, whatever appreciation or disappreciation about this his situation it is what kind of historically followed from the the uh, his action that is of concern yeah 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 um but Again, something, i think yeah go on in something you said um there is what if the historical action itself is regarded as immoral so not the subjective person but the historical action itself so conquesting right taking yeah. over peoples right it's something that not something that is just valorized anymore yeah or looked up to or seen as inspirational right yeah so in as... that sense certain historical personages you know have a bunch of statues they get taken down mm -hmm. yeah i guess it depends, right? Because I think Hegel's point is you have different ethical universalities. Mm -hmm. And the point is not which one is more moral than the other. The point is understanding how they develop from each other and why they develop from each other and seeing in this okay. development and yeah. necessary okay. chain. Okay, yeah. Yeah, that's and good. So, yeah. Right, and so you can take down the statue of someone that you think is immoral uh that's a, a personal you know that's a matter of taste or morality or whatever you think whatever, whatever reason you think you're doing it for but i think hegel's point would be that such a person is significant because they form part of world history because they are part of the progress that has brought you here that yeah has led you to this point sure um but i think that historical events and movements can be recognized as significant without valorizing them you can yeah. find them repugnant and shun them and stuff like that because yeah. of current morality and ethical life that one lives in right indeed indeed yeah i think you're right to say conquest nowadays it's difficult to imagine conquest being the next ethical shape um because oh, yeah yeah uh, yeah it doesn't seem to logically follow from where we currently are. Yeah. And if anything, the, the shape, the universal shape that came out of conquest is the fact that conquest shouldn't be done anymore because it's exactly. silly. Exactly. Yeah. Because <laughs> that's the technical term because it was silly. <laughs> well, you just, it's, it's just a change of management, right? But like, <laughs> I think you're really doing something new and interesting, but no. <laughs> change of man that yeah. trap greek king pff, potato potato yeah exactly yeah. um i think uh, hegel's opinion on this is very interesting mm -hmm. as well as yeah yeah it was yeah. he's thinking about this indeed yeah yeah uh, yeah it's interesting that this is a topic that he also touches on in 1822 mm -hmm. um yeah it was st still still for them an issue where they probably found some other people in the past before yeah, them they exactly. found repugnant yeah exactly yeah. So, it's very easy to imagine someone thinking Alexander being very unchristian, let's say. Yeah. And uh, being uncomfortable mm -hmm. with the valorization of Alexander. Yeah. For those reasons. So, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I have said all I have to say on this. Yes. Uh, yes. Do you have anything you want to add? I, no, no. I think we've uh, kind of explored this topic pretty thoroughly. And um, yeah. It's just, I really enjoy this actually. I think it's fascinating. Yeah, it is interesting how 
Hegel navigates passions, individual passions with self-interest and incentives, and at the same time being expressions of a divine idea or like or the greater universal that yeah. you know the greater kind of patterns that is at work among us as human beings as self-conscious creatures and that he navigates a middle way where it's neither one in service of the other one is the means for the other but that they are intertwined in a complex way that kind of achieves both ends at once this is like yeah. the supremely rational um kernel that it's for your own interest and the other people's interests oh it's like, it's like a, um, yeah, that's the dream jars against the mentality of the understanding which mm. wants either one or the other or yeah. a kind of yeah uh, right because we would typically think that your interest would be biased and in the way of the greater yeah, interest because it's your interest and therefore exactly. it, it detracts from other people's interests such as must be a compromise or that if a nation gets wealthy or is there is economic prosperity that is at the cost of somebody else you know falling behind or whatever yeah doesn't need to be that kind of logic yeah reason can think the more that do, do it the merrier it gets yeah 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 i mean all these are really interesting ideas and i can i can imagine someone actually watching this and being like this is all very abstract <laughs> uh, what does this actually mean so so i'm very keen to get into the actual case studies as it were right yeah and to, see, and to see how hegel actually sees these ideas playing out yeah uh, that's what i'm very yeah. interested to discover yeah me too that they'll be they'll be key because so far we're still in the introduction yeah 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 well, yeah, yeah 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 okay then so i guess that's all from us today that's all from us today i hope yeah. you enjoyed and uh if you are find this persuasive or not so persuasive or I'll be happy to hear from you what do you yeah, think yeah leave, leave a comment and we'll definitely engage do you think that uh, to do world historical actions requires you to be unhappy and uh, follow your passions as if it was the only thing that meant anything in the world do you think that world historical individuals are necessary to move world history forward oh interesting yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay right then so bye-bye so see you in the next episode bye-bye